Good morning. Jimmy is very happy. There are big white things falling out of the sky. So he will be smiling as he worships, but it won't be just because of the snow. It'll be because of the one who made the snow. Amen? Hey, that was good. There you go. That was for you, bud. Well, we are glad that you are here. My name is BJ Donahue. I'm one of the pastors here at Erlanger Baptist, and we are, we're excited to be able to come into this place where we do know the one who has all authority. Um, our life group was uh, recounting the story in Luke where the centurion comes and recognizes that Jesus is so incredible that he doesn't even have to show up and do something like personally. He can just speak it. And it just happens. He says, listen, you, just, you don't even have to come under my roof. Just say the name. Just say the word, and my servant will be healed. Like, it's an incredible picture of faith and a beautiful blessing for us to see that kind of faith lived out and to call us and invite us into that same kind of relationship. The God of the universe is sustaining every moment. The God of the universe is at work right now. The God of the universe knows you knows everything about you, made you, created a world in which he knew you would exist and intentionally chose that world so that you would exist. He knows the circumstances that you faced this past week. He knows the circumstances that you will face this coming week. And he has brought you here this morning to be a part of this service and participate. Like that's the God that we have. And that's the God that we have opportunity to know into worship this morning. And so I hope that you've come with that kind of expectation and that kind of realization. And if you haven't, be ye reminded now. Um, You come to worship the one and true living God. And that's incredible. All right. With that incredibleness... Um, there are things that are going on um, at our church that we want you to know about and be a part of. Um, Today, we have a new members class or prospective members class. Uh, Immediately following service, we'll meet in room 213, which is right through that door in the commons, um, just off to the left past the stairs. We'll go in there, and that's where you can come and learn about who we are, what we believe, um, see if this is where the Lord would have you. If you've been recently baptized and haven't had a chance to be in one of those, that's part of the membership process, and so make sure that you are there for that. Um, There is coming up in just a couple weeks a Valentine's dinner. Now, Wednesday is the 14th. So, gentlemen, this is your chance. You're going to look really impressive to your significant other when you say, honey, not only do I care about you, but I care about the Lord's work. And so I'm going to bring you to church on Wednesday night because we're going to eat well, but we're going to even be a part of something bigger that the Lord is doing. We're going to help students have an encounter with the Lord over summer at summer camp. By being there and eating food and enjoying fellowship and laughing and getting to stare at one another in the eye. God is going to be moving. Okay, so that's the, that's the shameless plug. On the flip side of that, we would love to invite you to be a, a part of that. It is one of those opportunities that we have to kind of rally around our students and to help them make it to camp. It's not cheap. If you have multiple kids, I don't know, um, it's even more expensive. And so there are people that can relate. I know, they're in the room. And so it's a chance for them to serve you guys, um, to be in relationship with you, even as um, they make some money to go towards camp. Uh, The meal, uh, there are two options. And uh, my wife is actually the head cook this year. Yeah, yeah, I spare no expense. That's what you do for Valentine's. You stick your woman in a kitchen all day long. <laughs> Don't learn from the example <laughs> before you at the moment. He will be making it up to her on a different night. Um, but uh, the two options, there's a marry me chicken, 
All right, so if, uh, if someone's dragging their feet, um, this is the meal, all right? Um, but it is, it is very good, and, and then there's also a balsamic pork tenderloin or pork loin that's going to be served as well. Um, both of those, I can attest to, uh, are very good meals, and so uh, it will definitely be worth it to come and to enjoy the food, but as I said, um, I would even challenge you um, as you come to that, uh, that you would consider how the Lord might use you to be a blessing to, to those kids. Yes, it's $15 per person or $25 per couple, but maybe the Lord puts on your heart to drop an extra $100, $200 in there um, just to bless those kids or 1000 Is that what I heard? This, uh, um, <laughs> you, you can take one of my kids home for a little while. All right. Uh, a couple other things that are going on um, as we are looking ahead. Uh, we have a marriage study that will be starting up. Again, let me remind you, that is for everyone in the room. Uh, it is for married and singles, and this has uh, non-Christians engaging in the conversation through the videos that are being played. And so if you know someone in your workplace that's not a believer, this is a great way for them to you know, have a conversation about what is marriage supposed to look like and how does it function and it's a great engagement in that. And so that'll be coming up in March, and you're going to hear uh, again more and more. But I, I don't want anybody to say, that's for married people, so it's not for me. It's for everybody here um, to be able to participate in. And every one of us can gain through that process. And we'll tell you about it more later. Um, if you are uh, wanting to play an instrument for the Easter uh, program, that Easter service, um, there's going to be a quick meeting after church for anyone who plays an instrument to kind of, uh, I guess, get a tally of who's interested and how, what instruments we have and uh, participate in that. So if you are interested, go to the choir room after service today. And then I just want to make you um, aware, uh, last weekend, uh, Mary Townsend, uh, one of our members sits with the Townsend family, this would be aunt to Adam and Megan, passed away. Uh, the funeral was on Friday, but uh, we didn't, it didn't happen over a weekend in the, in the sense that we had the opportunity to share that with you. And so we just want to make you aware of that um, as uh, the, this past week has kind of unfolded um, with our team heading to Poland, and we're going to pray for them in just a moment. But that kind of had to take place before Adam left, and so that was done on Friday. Uh, there's another uh, lady that passed away um, this past week, Betty Vining. Um, she was an older lady. Um, you may have seen her even the last couple months uh, in and out, sitting over here in a wheelchair. Uh, but she passed away, and so be in prayer for Lou, her husband. Uh, the funeral is on Tuesday. 11 to 1 is the visitation. 1 o'clock is the service, and it'll be here as well uh, for that one. So uh, just letting you know kind of about some member care that, that, that has happened recently um, in the life of our church. One final announcement before we do pray. Uh, the directories are in. Um, and so if you were pictured for the directory, you have a copy of that directory. After service, if you want to come into the commons, my wife is actually going to be there, and there's a, a checklist. And if you grab one for your family, it's one per family, one per photographed family. Um, you can receive those and just make sure you, she checks that off so we know that you got your copy of it. But those will be available in the commons uh, after service. Right now... On the other side of the planet, kind of, in Europe, um, our team has reached their destination, and right now, or right around now, they will actually be meeting with the kids and students that they are going to be ministering to over this coming week. Now, what makes that really exciting is that they're getting to see the kids that the Lord has led um, to them for this winter camp, and what makes it challenging is that they have been up since yesterday morning and haven't slept yet. And so they have been up um, all the way around the clock, and so they're somewhere around hour 30-ish. Uh, and so with all the energy that they're supposed to have to engage these kids, they're working on a deficit. And so uh, we're going to take some time in just a moment. Um, as I start the service, I'm going to pray for them. But just continue throughout the week. Uh, to keep them in your prayers, 
as they are over in uh, Poland, working, um, serving the Lord, building relationships. As we said last week, some of these kids that are coming already have a faith uh, relationship with Christ. Some are just kind of open to it and know that they get to get away uh, during this week and go to this camp because they've heard it's fun. And so they're coming for all different kinds of reasons, uh, but God has a reason that every one of them is coming, um, and that's to encounter him. So I'm glad that you guys are here today. I'm praying that we encounter the Lord here in this place, even as we gather to praise him because of who he is. So would you pray with me? Father, we come to you this morning grateful for the opportunity to be in this place to worship. Grateful to be in this place where we open your word freely. And Lord, it's our desire that we would hear from you today. It's our desire that we would encounter you today, that you would hear our prayers, our praises, that they would be lifted up as a pleasing aroma to you. Father, as we come into this place um, to lay our lives down before you, I ask that you would um, open yourself to us and open us to you. Father, as we have brothers and sisters right now from our group, from our faith family here serving in Poland, um, building the very beginnings of relationships with students, Father, we pray for strength for them. We pray for um, a favor in the eyes of the students with them. We pray for um, a quick connection and quick bonds to be made between these students and our um, team that has gone over. Lord, I pray that you would give them the words to say, that you would give them the thoughts to think, you would give them um, the places to be, the conversations to have, uh, Lord, the messages to deliver. And Father, I pray that it would be your spirit on display through them, that they would see love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. They would see you on display, that it would not just be um, a time away at a camp, but it would be an encounter with who you are. Uh, thank you for the willingness of those that, are, that have gone to Poland um, to join you at work in what you're doing. And we pray that you would pierce through the darkness there and that you would bring truth, you would bring hope, you would bring salvation, you would bring growth in the gospel. And Lord, as we come here, we pray for the same things. We are here asking you to do a work, to pierce through the darkness, to draw the lost to you, to take those who are in relationship with you and to move them deeper, that we might see you and that even in seeing you, we might worship you even more. God, thank you for the chance that we have to know the God of the universe who sends every snowflake, the God of the universe who sustains us, the God of the universe who has brought us to this very moment to be in your presence. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, I'll say this real quick. As we just heard about our Poland team that uh, just touched ground and is about to minister to children, uh, it's really cool what the Lord has been doing in our church with missions. We do have another opportunity to go to Bulgaria in a couple months, and we'll be having an interest meeting for that if you're interested. Uh, just want to let you know if you're, if you're interested in joining God's work or in missions on the foreign field, uh, come to that interest meeting next week. All right, let's stand and worship the Lord together. Oh, how sweet 
to trust in Jesus, just to trust His cleansing blood, just in simple faith to plunge me neath the healing cleansing blood. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how Trust Him more. I'm so glad, I'm so glad I learned to trust Thee. Precious Jesus, save your friend. And I know that thou art with me, will be with Let's sing that again. I'm so glad. I'm so glad I learned to trust thee. Precious Jesus, save your friend. And I know.
circles training which is merely an evangelism tool but an evangelism tool regardless of how effective and how clear a presentation it might be never leaves our mouth without a brokenness for a lost community for a lost family member for a lost friend it's knowledge But until we see people as God sees them, it doesn't come out. It doesn't get shared. And so it becomes a hope that everyone doesn't see. And everybody doesn't understand fully. And yet what we've been given is the opportunity to be the mouthpiece, the witness, the testimony of Christ. As we gather and we sing these things, There are people that drive by that don't even realize they're driving by a church service. That's not even on their radars. There are people that you work with who you could say, yeah, that person, they have no clue. Yeah, I've never shared with. This past week, as I was preaching out of 1 Samuel, when God comes to Samuel and says, how long will you grieve over these things? we made the comment that it was kind of at some level still commendable that he was broken over the spiritual decline that his nation was in that Saul who was supposed to be this person who had helped to point all these um, in his nation to this God who was still God even though he was king all that has just been falling apart and unraveling and Samuel was broken over that I think of Nehemiah who has broken over his people. And before he ever goes back and does a work, God has worked on his heart and prepared him for that moment. And so I just want us to take a moment as we just sang that song. The Lord says, beseech the Lord of the harvest that he would send out who? Workers. Not that he would be saving people and we just sit back and welcome them when they show up, but that he would send out the harvest the the harvesters those who would go out into the world that would make known the gospel and so would you just take a moment and just ask the lord is there someone in my life who is it lord in my own life that you want me to not just be an example but speak the gospel as well so that our hearts are broken and we're ready with whatever evangelism tool we provide to be ones who then go and use it for the glory of God so take a moment by your heads as the musicians continue to play and just ask the Lord who is that person and if there's no one then ask the Lord to break your heart that he would give you someone
Father, I recently heard someone say, what a question it would be if we would, when we get to heaven one day, would not ask or be excited about simply the fact that we are there, but ask who is there because of us? Who did you bring to yourself through us? that the gospel and the work of the gospel as, as you have predetermined that it would be used through your people to bring people to you, that we would be vessels. And Father, it, it is mind-blowing at times when we think about all the truths of scriptures, all the things that it says about who you are, all the truths that we have about what Jesus Christ has done and what he can offer anyone, and yet we let an enemy deceive us into thinking that the gospel has no power to change our neighbor or our friend or our family member. That they are not interested, that they will not hear. And yet your word says that the gospel is the power of God for salvation. That it shines light into darkness and it saves the lost because of what Christ has done on the cross. Father, we are equipped with so much knowledge. But would you equip us with your heart? Would we be broken over the reality of a place called hell? Would we be broken over the fact that you loved us so much that you sent your son to die in our place so that we would not face such a place. And that as we proclaim that message, that it will be received so that others will join us in declaring the greatness of our God. So that not that this local church grows in size, but that it impacts this community that those without hope would find hope even as we who had no mercy have found mercy. God, that you would raise us up as workers for the gospel, that we would entrust ourselves to you and to your power and allow ourselves just to be conduits of a message that will speak to the deepest of hearts and their needs. Because it is you we find life. It is you we find hope. It is in you we find joy. So God, if you have laid someone on our hearts in this time, now Lord, ordain our steps that we would have opportunity. Remove the excuses and grant us grace to speak. And as awkward as it may be, do not let the enemy win. But would you be on display? Thank you for the chance we have to sing. Help us not to stay quiet, not to keep it to ourselves. We do not have reason to fear anymore. We know the risen King. In his name we pray. Amen. We're going to go back into the name above all names. Um, but in the, with what Bija was saying, when we get to all praise, you are worthy of all praise. Let's make this a prayer, like intercessory for those who are, that those who came to our minds who need the Lord, who don't know the Lord yet. Maybe it's our neighbor, our brother, our cousin, uh, someone we work with. Let's go back into this and worship the Lord. And when we say all praise, think about that person. Pray to the Lord for that person. And we're going to change the lyrics a little bit. Instead of saying, my heart will sing how great, Let's sing, our hearts will sing how great is our God. Can we do that? Let's all stand together.
the voices, name above. You're the name above all names. You are worthy of all praise. Our hearts and our hearts will sing how great is our God. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Give the Lord, give the Lord praise. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. There's a reason why the curse of sin is broken. There's a reason why the darkness runs from light. There's a reason why we stand here now forgiven. Jesus is alive. And there's a reason why we are not overtaken. There's a reason why we sing on through the night. And there's a reason why our hope remains eternal. Jesus is alive. And praise the King, because He is risen. Praise the King, He's alive. can be courageous there's a reason why the dead are made alive there's a reason why we share his resurrection cause Jesus is alive he's alive praise the king oh praise the
Jesus, we can sing hallelujah. Hallelujah. Because you are indeed alive. You died for us on that cross, but three days later you rose again. And now we're called sons and daughters. Lord, thank you that we can come into your throne room and sing those words to you as your children. Thank you for the invitation that you have welcomed us into. Thank you for welcoming us into your presence. Thank you that there was one calumet worthy in all of heaven and the earth. One counted worthy. For that we thank you. We thank you. We thank you. Church, just say thank you to Jesus. Just say thank you, thank you, thank you to Jesus for what you have done for us. May we not take it for granted. Thank you. You may be seated. If you have a Bible, you can open it up to... 1 Samuel 17. You will quickly know the story. It is one of the kids' favorites of all time. It is David and Goliath. I'm not going to actually read the passage in its entirety because it is kind of long. But we're going to read a chunk, um, a, a large chunk of it. Let's set the stage. David has been anointed. As last chapter, Saul had met his kingly demise, not his physical yet demise, but in many ways, um, God had found him wanting and had removed his kingship. And so the question was, who would fill the void? And a young shepherd boy would be the one who would fill the void. And so Saul is now being replaced by a new king. And that is becoming more and more evident. And we're going to see the struggle between them as we finish the book of 1 Samuel. For Samuel's sake, he has had the opportunity to anoint and now Watch as God, maybe from the sidelines himself, God doing these things in the life of David. David has an interesting moment where he is found out to be someone who can play the harp. And so he ends up actually already beginning to engage Saul at some level. And now it's that time where the Philistines and the Israelites which was much symbolic of all of the life of Saul, are now once again fitted in battle array against one another. And so this is the backdrop of 1 Samuel 17. There's war to be had. The Philistines are on the attack. They're in Israel attacking cities, and the garrison of Saul has come and has positioned themselves on one side of the mountain, and the Philistines are on the other. And the confrontation is about to take place. But you'll notice how I titled the message. It is, The Battle Belongs to the Lord. We oftentimes refer to this story as David and Goliath. And indeed it is, and we will talk about David, and we will talk about Goliath. But one thread that runs through this entire passage is really God versus all others. 
And you, you see a faith that drives someone to live in light of who God is, and that's what brings the victory ultimately and the deliverance for the nation of Israel. And so as we prepare, let's pray and ask the Lord just to take a very common, familiar story and make it fresh and new again. Father, we do come to you, and we thank you for this word. We thank you for um, this account where we see a young man used by you in an incredible way as you take an anointing that you have placed upon him and begin to make it more and more public. But Lord, it is obvious that his heart is set on you. And so help us, even as we look at this, to think about our own lives and to apply these as living and active words to ourselves. Would you speak into the circumstances in our own lives, the things that we would, quote unquote, call a Goliath? And would you be a God who is found faithful to be the God of the universe as we trust in you? Teach us, lead us, Holy Spirit, guide us. In your name we pray, amen. So, they're camped. First thing I want you to see is this. When we focus on the challenge, every detail and excuse is magnified. When we focus on the challenge, every excuse we can think of, every detail of the circumstances gets magnified. You will notice the beginning in verse 4, as you have the two camps positioned, a champion will emerge from the Philistines to taunt the armies of Israel. And what is interesting is this is no normal taunt and this is no normal champion we get a long description of him starting in verse 4 the champion comes out of the armies of the philistines named goliath from gath whose height was six cubits and a span it's over nine foot tall just ponder that for a second that kind of size he had a bronze helmet on his head he was Uh, clothed with scale armor which weighed 5,000 shekels of bronze he also had a bronze greaves on his legs and bronze javelin slung between his shoulders the shaft of his spear was like the weaver's beam and the head of his spear of his spear weighed 600 shekels of iron his shield carrier also walked before him this is a daunting figure with incredibly decked out armor Scripture takes time to walk the entire look of this guy so that we understand what Israel is facing and we get the details. Someone who, when we would look at them, we would say, there is no way. Where is the, 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 the chink in the armor on this man? He possesses every weapon he needs. He has all of the strength and the size to overwhelm us. When we focus on the challenge, we're acutely aware of the details. We often know the ins and outs of all the reasons why we can't do something. Do you know people like this who can list every reason that something is impossible? They are almost pros at finding every reason that you can't do something. And they can give you all of the things. It's like they are sitting here in 1 Samuel Chapter 17, and just listing, you think you could actually go up against this, 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 this. This is the circumstance that they faced. The description of Goliath is detailed and all the more intimidating. The point is being made, he is a formidable foe. This is not going to be a walk in the park. Entering the promised land. Do you remember the story when they went over and they saw how great it was? What did they come back and say? Everything's awesome, but they're fortified cities, they're giants, and we look like grasshoppers in their sights. This challenge again was real, and again, the position that they were taking was one of fear. There seemed to be no way out of the confrontation. Look at verse 8 through 11, Goliath comes out. And gives them a proposition. Listen, we don't all have to die. This is what I'll do. I'll come down. I'll represent my people. 
You bring out your best warrior. We'll go head to head. Whoever wins, rules. He does this day in and day out. Now, let's be honest. This is a confrontation that is stacked against Israel. It is seemingly best suited for the Philistines, not for them. It's like going 1v1 and the Philistines have the overall number one draft pick on their side. And here's the kicker. Both sides knew it and knew it well. It's why the Israelites fled every day from him and his threats. Scripture says that he did this for 40 days. Verse 36, 40 days coming out and saying, I defy you, send someone against me. Now, day one, okay, you're a little scared. You go back to your camp and you go, yeah, guys, who's going? Not me, I'm not going. Okay, day two, they come back out. Oh, nope, 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 nope. Okay, somebody's got to go out there, right? At this point, you're starting to think, okay, we're drawing straws. How are we getting out there? What is going to happen? Who's going to be the one who goes for us? After 40 days, everybody knows that everyone else in their camp is dejected. It's not that somebody's holding back, just waiting, you know, letting everybody else go first. No, okay, fine, guys, I'll be the one. No, no, at this point, everyone is humiliated. 40 days of being mocked. 40 days of flight running back in fear. 40 is a time of trial, of testing, right? We have 40 showing up in a lot of places. We have the raining for 40 days. We have Moses up on the mountain for 40 days. We have the Israelites in the land of promise for 40 days. We have Jesus in the wilderness being tested for 40 days. This is one of those moments, those 40 days. And they are being tested. And the question is, is there faith among you? Is there confidence among you? We even read in verse 25 that there's a reward being offered. This sounds like the promised land again. When Moses or Joshua says, who will go up this area and will defeat them? And what does Caleb say? Yeah, God has sustained me. I'm 85 years old, but I totally believe that if I go up there, I will have victory. Let me go. I will take it. Saul offers the same kind of thing. In fact, if you look in the, the verse, in verse 25 at the end, it says, his father's house will be free in Israel. And commentators believe that that's like free from taxation. Like you are, you get the IRS, there's no more IOU. You get my daughter's hand in marriage, you become a part of the royal family. Like he's laying it out for them. Will anybody hear this? Does anybody not know the reward? No, they do. David comes and asks about it. Everybody knows this is what the king will do for such a one who does this. But the challenge was very real before them. And every detail and every excuse to stay hidden remained. Second thing I want you to see is this. We can be quick to point out our apparent insignificance and inabilities. We can be really quick to point out insignificance and inabilities. So while all of this is happening, David's father says, hey, your three oldest brothers are down fighting against the Philistines. I want you to take some food to them and take some food to the commander of the armies and I want you to go and I want you to present that to him and see how my sons are doing and report back to me what's going on. And so David comes and he shows up. Verse 20, he rose early in the morning. He leaves his flock with the keeper and takes the supplies and went as Jesse had commanded him. He came to the circle of the camp while the army was going out in battle array, shouting the war cry. This must have been pretty exciting. Israel and the Philistines drew up in battle array, the army against army. David leaves the baggage in the care of the baggage keeper, runs to the battle line and enters in order to greet his brothers. And as he's talking with them, behold, the champion, the Philistine from Gath named Goliath was coming up from the army of the Philistines and he spoke the same words and now David hears them. 
all the Israelites, in verse 24, the men of Israel saw the man, they fled from him and were greatly afraid. And the men asked themselves, have you seen the man who's coming up? Surely he's coming up to defy Israel. They show or tell David the promise. And in verse uh, 26, David asks, wait a minute, what will be done for the man who kills this, this one and takes away the reproach of Israel? They say again, they tell him what it is. And now, verse 28, the brothers chime in. Little brother has come to the battle scenes. He was supposed to be there for food. Dad sent him. Oh, but now he's meddling. And the brothers are not impressed. Listen to what they say to him. Verse 28, Eliab, his oldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men, and Eliab's anger burned against David. And he said, why have you come down? With whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I mean, you can hear it, can't you? Like absolutely mocking this little kid. Now, we talked about last week, right? He was anointed before his brothers. And so in a lot of ways, his brothers know that there's something that's special. And so now David is sticking his head in over here, and they're going, oh, get back in the stinking field where you belong. You can number the number of sheep on your hands. That's how few you have to take charge of. Who do you think you are? We are quick to have our lack of skills pointed out to us, whether by the enemy, someone who wants to come against us, or sometimes ourselves. But I wonder in this moment if there's a level of embarrassment by the brothers. Jesse says to them, to uh, David before he leaves, he says, Go to your brothers who are fighting against the Philistines and see how they're doing. And so what does do? David shows up and what does he see? He sees his brothers and all of Israel not fighting. He sees all of them standing on a hillside listening to someone taunt God and Israel and then running in fear. Report that back, brother, to our fathers. That's what we're doing. This is a moment where all of these things are coming out and the attacks are not just being hurled at Israel, but now there's infighting and they're hurling them at each other. David, you are insignificant here. You should not even be here. Saul, even later when David comes to Saul and makes his kind of pronouncement, hey, I'll go fight. Look at verse 33. Saul says to him, um, you are but a youth. He has been a warrior from his youth. Like it's, There's obvious issues. Who is this one who is coming? And so here's my question to you. Because we know how that story ends. What are the lies that you're listening to in your own life? What are the mindsets that you've adopted that hold you back from believing God in your life, from seeing victory over sin, for seeing victory in your faith. We have many foes, and they parade themselves even as friend and family, and yet the enemy can use them with their words. And here is a man who has an opportunity to rise above all of that, because he knows something. He knows who his God is. The third thing I want you to see is this. Faith responds in willingness. Seeing trials quickly in light of God's power and his presence. I think it's really incredible here. David has not been here any of the 40 days. And now God providentially brings him into this moment. And David does not waver. He does not flinch. He does not sit down and plan and process. He does not drag his feet. He is willing and ready in this moment to go to battle the moment he is presented with the scenario. There is a quick and a confident obedience of faith. Does he understand the situation? Yeah. Does he understand the fear that's involved? Yes. Look at verse 32. It says, David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail on account of him. He's watched it. He knows everyone is scared to death. He knows that he's not in the majority. 
He knows that he's presenting a different view. But he's presenting one that is with God and not living without him. The crucible of life is so often most easily demonstrated or the trust that we have in God is most easily demonstrated when things get really tough. When you're presented with a trial, that's when the strength of your faith becomes evident. Looking in to see how quickly and how decisively you respond. And here we have David responding quickly. Who is this guy? What do you get if you go? I will go. You can't go. Yes, I can. Don't let anybody be worried. I will go. And notice how he describes him. He says, your servant, verse 32, verse 32 again, your servant will go and fight this Philistine. And then he goes on and later and says about him that this is an uncircumcised one who is coming against the living God. He knows the place of this Philistine and he's ready to respond. But he is not ignorant. Fourth thing I want you to see is this. God uses the events in our lives to prepare us for the next steps of faith. Saul looks at him and says, no, no, you're a kid. This guy's been a warrior since he was a kid. 34, but David. But David said to Saul, no, no, God's been working in my life. You see, your servant, me, I, was tending my father's sheep. Wait a minute, out on the field? What, being the shepherd? Yeah, and when I was doing that, when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb from the flock, I went out after him and attacked him, and I rescued it from his mouth. And when he rose up against me, I seized him by his beard and struck him and killed him. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, since he has taunted the armies of the living God. You write, he, David looks at all the things that he's been through. And he says, wait a minute. God's prepared me for this moment. I've had other victories, and I know that God sustained me in those, and God gave me those, and God will give me the next one. You look at me, and you think, how do you kill a bear? How do you kill a lion? I've not done either. But God was preparing David to face another giant. And he was proving himself once again. And so this isn't, a, um, this isn't ignorance. This isn't bliss. This is confidence and faith. These things come on the back of those previous encounters and experiences where God had delivered before. God knew the God of Israel. And his confidence was in God's strength, not his own. This faith had not developed in a vacuum. It had been cultivated through test after test, the shepherd boy turned king had been prepared for this moment. And you contrast that with Saul's reluctance. Verse 37. I mean, hear what he says. Go. May the Lord be with you. Just take a, take a pause there. This is the king of the nation. His reputation and his nation's freedom hangs in the balance. And no one will go out and fight. So he's reduced to looking at a shepherd boy and saying, you're all we have. I find that a bit shocking. That you're willing to put victory and the future of your people's freedom in the hands of a young shepherd that just happened to show up that day to bring bread to his older brothers. But instead, as Saul would soon find out, he will bring life and freedom to his entire nation. Next thing I want you to see is this. We aren't to fight God's battle with man's strength. So Saul is still in his own little mind here. Verse 38 so Saul clothed David with his garments. He gave him a bronze helmet on his head. He clothed him with armor. Verse 39. David was a ruddy man. 
Saul was a big tall man. You can imagine what this looked like on David. It says, David girded his sword over his armor. He tried to walk, for he had not tested them. You, you can imagine, like, he's like doing this number, right? It's like the kid who puts on their parents' shoes and tries to walk in them, right? Gets a couple steps, and then things don't go so well, and they fall. Right? This is that moment where Saul's like, you're the best we got? I'm going to give you the best I have. It's all of my armor. I'm the king. He probably has the best armor of anyone in the army. And so he's like, okay, you take my stuff. Go for it, bud. Good luck. And David's like, mm -mm. And David's response is really simple. David's response is, this isn't me. And this isn't what God wants to do through me. And I'm not going to rely on that human wisdom and that human strength. Verse 39, David says, these things actually hold me back. The things that man thinks makes him strong actually become the things that weaken him and render him incapable of doing what he's asked. How often do we take up the strengths of man and the resources of man and actually have those things thwart our success instead? David takes those things off. David rejects the king's offer, probably under a lot of pressure and expectation. But he's believing God and not trusting in man. And so God uses what David already had. Look at verse 40. He took his stick in his hand, his stick. He had a stick. Okay. Sword, stick. And chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook, and he put them in the shepherd's bag, which he had. Do you notice this? This is not what Saul gave. This is what he had. Even in his pouch and his sling in his hand. And he approached the Philistine. Next thing. Our motives are expressions of our faith. Goliath and David... Now meet on the battlefield. Goliath, it would have been really cool to watch. After 40 days of taunting, you would think they would have been like, hey, go hire someone from the, from the Amorites or go down to Egypt and get somebody. Bring him up. We'll delay him as long as we can. So after 40 days, who you got? And this little kid comes out. You can imagine how, like, you come at me with sticks as if I'm a dog, is what Goliath says. Who are you? And notice what it says. It says that Goliath mocks him. Verse 43, the Philistine cursed David by his gods. David's had about enough. You're going to defy the living God. Verse 10, verse 25, verse 26, verse 36, verse 45. To deny or to taunt, same Hebrew word used five times. That's what the Philistines was, was doing. This is a story of the nations around the nation of Israel taunting the God of Israel. And it was time for the God of Israel to show up. And he would use a man named David to do it. But this was a battle that belonged to the Lord. Look at all the verses, the response in David. Verse 45, he says, come, I come in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel. Verse 46, this day the Lord will deliver you into my hands. Then he says, all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Verse 47, the Lord does not deliver by sword or by spear. For the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into my hand. This is very clear. You mock me by your gods, I will show you the power of mine. David goes to the battle not unprotected. 
but in the power of God and the strength of his armor. And he goes and he accomplishes the work that God has because God was going to be on display that day. And he needed a David. And he proved himself through one of faith. And so, as long and drawn out as this is, for 40 days, one verse finishes it up. David takes out the stone as he rushes to meet Goliath, and Goliath is rushing to meet him. He takes out a stone, just the first one, spins it, boom, bam. Before there was concussion protocol, there was Goliath. Down he goes. It reminds me of when Jesus is coming back and the, the armies of the world gather and it says that he just destroys them with the word of his mouth and it's like over and you're like, what? Like this was supposed to be a knockdown down drag out this ended up a Mike Tyson when he was really young first rounder everybody was probably upset how much they paid to watch that thing happen it was over before it started they're going David's going down David's going down there it's over we won I didn't even see what happened in one verse boom and then in the next verse he comes doesn't have a sword of his own because he said, I don't need your saw. And he takes Goliath's own sword and chops off his head and ends it. And guess what happens in that one moment by one person living a life of faith? Everyone around him was instantly emboldened to follow. Others are emboldened by our acts of faith and obedience. David prevails over the Philistine with the sling and the stone. He beheads him, and in verse uh, 51, it says, When the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they fled. And then the men of Israel and Judah arose and shouted and pursued the Philistines as far as the valley and to the gates of Ekron. And the slain Philistines lay along the way. Like, they absolutely had the tables completely turned in an instant of faith. I was at a conference this past week, and there was a church planter who's up in Boston right now. And he said, the reality is, we don't have a lot of just faithful Christians. Like, literally, there are people in Boston who have no, no point of contact with just a faithful Christian living out their lives, whether in their work, their family, in their recreation. And he said this quote. He said, the biggest hurdle to non-believers in Boston is that they don't have one faithful practicing believer. They need faithful members in churches up there who are just living out the gospel. This was a testimony. David was a testimony. He was someone who believed God and believed God would show up and that God had power to have victory. He believed that this was a spiritual battle that was going to be raged and that God would always and triumphantly come out on top. David was the shot in the arm or the stone in the sling that led to victory couple applications for us first question these are going to be all in the form of questions just to help you think what are some spiritual markers in your life that have prepared you for this moment what are things that God has been doing in your life he does not waste them what are things that God has been doing in your life to bring you to this moment What obstacles have you faced recently? And the question, how have you responded to them? Have you responded in your own strength, in your own understanding? 
Or have you done it by relying on God and his power? It's a real, it's an honest question. What has he been doing to prepare you? What are the obstacles right now that you are facing? Are you doing that in a way that demonstrates a faith that has been nurtured over time? Are you doing it still in your own strength leading up to this moment? The third one, do you see the trials and adversities of your life as the Lord's battlefield moments? Or do you see them as moments that you have to figure out and you have to gain victory? And he's sitting back watching. You see, David, when David looked at the battle, he did not see it humanly. He saw it as an offense, an attack against God and his people. And he lived it out spiritually in the physical. And the question for us is, the things that you're going through, do you just see them horizontally? Or are you willing to see them vertically? And allow God to show you how to not only perceive them, but to gain victory through his power in them. Here's a litmus test. Are the people around you encouraged and spurred on by your faith? Are you one that people turn to and go, I don't know how you're getting through this, but I want to know. I don't know how you can actually still be joyful. Look at the world. It's horrible. I can't believe that you are not cursing our boss along with us or complaining about our work environment conditions with us. Why are you different? Why can you still smile? Are other people around you encouraged and spurred on? This church, we need encouragers and we need ones that spur us on. Who are the Davids? Who are the Calebs? Who are going to walk in a, ma- in a way of faith that compels and propels others around them and this church along with them to continue the work of God? Or are you just going to complain and sit back and talk about all the problems and all the details and all the excuses and then if you don't like the answer to some of those what are you then doing today that can better prepare you to live in greater faith tomorrow David did not show up on the battlefield that day unequipped because he had been equipped in his journey to that moment We are not instant faith people. It is a life journey. It's one that can start even today as you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And then you begin that journey so that the battle you see belongs to the Lord and you get to live that out over and over, greater and greater for his glory. And for the sake of the lost, that need to see something different. Will you pray with me? Father, thank you that you take a willing vessel and you used him. Lord, there's a reason he was anointed. We can see it as his his life is unfolding, the confidence and the faith that he had in you. And Father, He then becomes our model. He becomes our example of someone who trusted in you even when it didn't make sense, even when the odds were stacked against him. Yet he did not even see the odds as stacked against him because he understood that you were with him. Father, so often we see adversities as greater than they are. And we see the things that confront us as more powerful than even we give acknowledgement of who you are. And so, Father, I pray that you would raise up Davids. You would raise up men of faith. Women of faith. Youth of faith. Children of faith. That would, because of their knowledge and their relationship with you, See every moment as a new opportunity for potentially your victory and your renown. 
And God, would that spur us? Would we as a church family go out in the name of Jesus Christ, the one who has conquered all things for us as our greatest motivator, our greatest example? And when we go out and see the victory that the, that the Israelites saw, even as their king brought victory for them by defeating that Goliath, ultimately you came and you defeated death, hell, sin, and the grave. And so we praise you and we follow you. God, give us the grace to trust you, to acknowledge you, and to see you work. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, just a reminder, if you are playing an instrument, you can meet in the choir room. If you are interested in learning more about Erlinger Baptist, um, I'll be meeting with them in room 213 in just a little while. Um, may you go out um, and live a life of faith. Um, I, I challenge you, and then bring back the story um, that you might encourage us as well. Father, as we leave this place, may we go out knowing that you are the God on high, that the same God who showed up in incredible power on a hillside against the giant is the same God who exists and still reigns today. And even in greater glory, because you have sent Jesus Christ and he has accomplished the work that David would point to. And so we have even a greater understanding and we have the spirit not only with us, but in us. And so help us to live out that truth in all of the battles. May the battle belong to you. In your name we pray. Amen. You're dismissed.